Good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church of San Bernardino and Bridges Presbyterian Fellowship in Big Bear. We gather this Pentecost Sunday in the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that brought the disciples together so many years ago. It is His Spirit that brings us together, even though we practice worshiping apart. Let us pray. Let the Spirit come and fill and pray and laugh in us, O oh God. Let the Spirit come and be in the silences between our words. As our lungs and lips breathe in and out, and we consider how much a blessing that simple act is, may true needs, deep longings, unglimpsed hopes, and paralyzing fears be exhaled into your heart through the Spirit sighing. Let the Spirit come and lead us to one another so that we receive not just personal blessings, but the wonderful gathered vision and vocabulary of your Pentecost. But the wonderful but the wonderful gathered vision and vocabulary of your Pentecost people, where the distance may be physical, but never spiritual. Amen. you so much. I hope you are doing good work and learning important things and taking care of your families. I hope you are ready for summer. It sure feels hot and summery. I hope you are remembering that God is with you wherever you go. So today is Pentecost Sunday. We put all the red and fire-colored things up in the church. Usually we go outside onto the lawn, do you remember? And I take a white dove and let it go in the air, and all the other doves follow it in flight. Yeah, we always have fun on Pentecost Sunday. And sometimes we have streamers. Do you remember these? You can throw them in the air and play with them. You can tie them around your chair, or you can tear a piece off, put it around your neck. Why do we do that? Well, we, we do it to remember 
that the Spirit of God is like the wind. We can't see it, but we can see what it does. The Spirit of God, like the wind, is surprising. The Spirit of God makes things dance like trees that we don't think of usually as dancing. The Spirit of God makes things bright and full of love and exciting. Maybe you remember playing with these streamers in our sanctuary. We would throw them around the room and throw them and throw them and throw them. And afterwards, we would all be connected by a strip of colored crepe paper, a way of making our eyes able to see that by God's Holy Spirit, we are all connected even when we don't have crepe paper. We are connected invisibly by bonds of love that God builds between us. Well, I miss you on Pentecost, and I hope you miss Pentecost too, but I hope you remember some of our Pentecost traditions because there will be a day when we celebrate them again. Meanwhile, remember that the Spirit is surprising. The Spirit is bright. The Spirit connects us in love. Keep your eyes open this week. Maybe God's Spirit will surprise you in a way you don't expect. I love you, and I will see you soon. Happy Pentecost. A reading from Acts of the Apostles, the story of the birthday of the church, the day we call Pentecost. Listen for a word from God, which is for you. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we heard them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. The scriptures this morning is from John 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow many rivers of living water. 
Now he said this about the spirit, which the believers, which believers in him were about to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I begin this morning with a confession. I like to be good at things. I mean, I really like to be good at things. It makes me feel accomplished and safe and cheerful. In college, I was a person who mostly signed up for things I thought I would already be good at. And that pattern has held for much of my professional life. The word that leaps out from the Acts story of Pentecost for me is perplexed. Perplexed. Those who were gathered when the Spirit arrived were definitely amazed and astonished, which is all well and good, but they were also perplexed. They were perplexed. And yet I try mostly to arrange my life for very limited perplexity. Just about everything about my work these days feels perplexing. Boundaries of quarantine and limited reopening and uncertainty about what will come next financially or in terms of the virus or in terms of faith communities. And it feels perplexing to me to long so deeply for my community and for the experience of gathered worship. But the acknowledgement that those who first felt the Spirit blow through their midst, those who were there at the birthday of the church, felt, alongside their excitement and wonder, like me. They felt perplexed, and that is giving me hope this week. What if perplexity and discomfort and awkwardness are a sign that the Spirit is doing a new thing. What if I should be grateful for it? Or to look at it another way, what if too much comfort and familiarity means I lose touch with the fire of life and the fresh wind the Spirit wants to blow my way? About six months ago, I felt called in a series of coincidences, you know, those coincidences that God brings into your life. I felt called to begin a new rhythm of life, a new practice of self-care. As this began to come into focus, I called my friend who is a brilliant psychotherapist and a beautiful soul to talk this over with her. And after listening and mm-hmm-ing for a while and asking some clarifying questions, she said this. What will you do when you're bad at it? What will you do when you don't follow through on these grand and beautiful plans of yours? What happens when you default to hurrying and scurrying and dancing as fast as you can because that is your most familiar adaptive strategy. I did not welcome her question. I wanted her to tell me how brilliant my idea was, how clearly it was of the spirit. I wanted her to say something that made me feel accomplished, and safe and cheerful. I did not appreciate her question then, but I do now, because as near as I can tell, I am living that question. I am living a ministry that I am not good at and never imagined. For example, all my life I have felt camera shy, and now this is the way I get to meet with you every single week. And I 
don't like leading into the unknown. I like having charts and books of order. I am Presbyterian for God's sake. I like to know where we're going. I like to have a map. And I don't know how to do pastoral care or partner with leaders in trying to live into God's will from a distance. Nor do I know much about how to accompany Tom as he recovers from his surgery this week. And by the way, you at Bridges Fellowship and you who care for him at First Press, he is improving and I'm still not very good at being his partner. Let me tell you a story. Another example of doing ministry I don't feel good at. Sam Ponder and his wife Tinka and their kids were members of this congregation for decades. And a few years ago, they decided to move across the country to the East Coast where they could live near their daughter, Gwen, who had settled there. Sam died, went home to be with his Lord a week ago on Friday. And Gwen contacted me and said, I know we cannot gather people for a memorial service in this time and place, but I have read a document online about how you could do a memorial service by Zoom. Zoom is that online platform that so many people are using for meetings in this time when we cannot be in the same building together. And I thought, dear God, save me from a Zoom memorial service. But we agreed it would be a smart thing for me to learn how to do, even if it was a steep learning curve. And so we decided to try. I will spare you all the details of things that went south or almost went south or drove us nuts. But I will tell you this, that on Saturday when we completed our time together, I was struck by the fact that there was a genuine sweetness about our remembering, that there was a surprising sense of gatheredness. Jim Morris, zoomed in to that service and afterwards said to me by phone, I was surprised at how touching it was. While stories were being told about Sam or while scripture or words of encouragement were being read, to be able to see the faces of those who were receiving those gifts, usually at a memorial service, I'm looking at the back of someone else's head. It was surprisingly intimate though we were separated by miles and time zones. Wow, I thought, here is a gift in something that perplexes me, something I'm not very good at. Here is something that the Spirit used for good. I've been listening while I've been walking to podcasts during this time. And there's one that really struck me as useful. The key people in the conversation were authors Jen Hatmaker and Kate Bowler. They're both women in their 30s, reflecting on where God is in the church in this time of pandemic and quarantine. And they reminded me that we never really had control over the details of our lives. We just thought we did. And we arranged our individual lives and our common life for limited amounts of perplexity because we like what's safe and familiar and known. In this podcast, they ask each other, what can offer us hope and peace even now? even in these days? Well, certainly not a Christian worldview, which we have often tolerated, a Christian worldview that says, if we do this and this and this, what we will get is health, happiness, prosperity. That may sell well, but it's not the truth now. And it never has been the truth. It's not the story of Jesus. 
It's not the story of the first disciples, and it's not the story of the early church. Kate says, look, Jesus comes, shows us who God is, and then leaves. Sends the Holy Spirit, but we still have to figure out how to live as followers of Jesus in our own time and place. We still have to figure out how, in other words, some of the perplexity is built in. And this is not a woman who speaks from a casual knowledge of this. She knows whereof she speaks. She's an accomplished author and an academic. She was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer in her middle 30s when her only child was one year old. And she says this, something hard leaves you broken, but it leaves you broken open and able to see things you couldn't see before. What if this time, in our common life as a congregation, in a life of the church universal, in my life in particular, what if in this time when I am perplexed and broken open, what if we will be able to learn things we could not see before? Maybe being perplexed, maybe not feeling accomplished and safe and cheerful all the time, is like being thirsty. It's uncomfortable in a way that drives you to address it. And notice what John has Jesus say in the reading we've heard this morning. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink out of the believer's heart will flow rivers of living water. And Jesus does not say out of a particular building or out of a particular way of gathering or out of our security or, God forbid, our complacency will flow rivers of living water. No, they flow out of the believer's heart. And they are pointed to by our thirst by our longing. That's how we find what's in there. Our thirst will drive us to our source, and our source will never be far from us. We get to test what we say we believe about the Holy Spirit in these days. We get to test God's presence with us right where we are, and at work amidst and among us, even when we are separated from one another. In this chapter of the Christian story, we get to find out something new about the presence and the grace of God. We get to learn a deeper love for one another and for the earth. I like to be good at things. And I largely stick with what I know I like. But this is not the season for that. The Spirit is interested in teaching me, and I think in teaching all of us, new things. And new things, by definition, are awkward and clumsy and hard. Bethany gave me a Mother's Day gift I'm so excited about. She gave me a little jar of sourdough starter and a lesson in baking bread. Now, some of you know that I love to bake bread, and I do it with some frequency, especially when the weather seems to invite it. But this thing is a whole new animal. The dough is sticky and slimy. The texture is all wrong, 
And the timing that has gone down into my brain and into my body is way off. You leave things alone for 12 hours. You put them in the fridge overnight. You take them out. You turn them upside down. It's completely perplexing. I worked on a loaf all day yesterday, setting the timer over and over again, going into the kitchen to fiddle with it and do the flipping and the turning and the pulling and the stretching. This morning I got up super early, heated my oven for an hour, put the pot in it, and then added the bread. And here it is. It's gorgeous on the top but pretty heavy and pretty flat. The one I baked yesterday was so much better. And I looked at it and I was perplexed and I thought, look, a sermon illustration, my perplexing bread. I like to do stuff I know how to do. I like to do stuff I knew do well, but sometimes some things are worth being bad at, are worth being perplexed by are worth being frustrated by so that our longing drives us to try and try again. So I'll let you know next week if I've been able to make a better loaf than this one. I think this one might be destined to be croutons, but I like croutons, so we'll live. The word that jumped out of the birth of the church story for me today was perplexed. I love being excited. I love being amazed. I love being astonished. And I am trying to learn that there are gifts in being perplexed, in being broken open, in trying something new, and in trusting that Holy Spirit in new and unprecedented ways. Thanks be to God for the one who has called us, who will walk with us this entire perplexing journey, and who is ever faithful. Amen.
as we pray this morning, I will pause at the end of each section and give you a chance to pray the prayers of your heart with me. Then I will say, God in your mercy. And I invite you to say, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, come loving Jesus, come glorious God, come among us and hallow our prayers. We pray for the places in our world where there is poverty, fear, war, and illness. May all who recognize your name hear you calling them to be peacemakers. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for young Christians, young in years, young in faith. May the faith we pass on to them be a reflection of the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray for our graduates and all our students as the academic year comes to an end. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our local churches. May all who celebrate this Pentecost experience your presence and be filled with power and joy. We pray for all who continue to worship and serve in a variety of ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are ill or in trouble or in any kind of need. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who are isolated in their illness and those who care for them. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves, our hopes, our questions, our needs, our dreams. Come, holy and life-giving spirit, renew our lives with love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bright God of life, burn in our lives. Make us clean and holy. Warm us with courage and joy. Keep us in the mystery of your glory all the days of our journey home. And let us join together once more and say the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus says, let everyone who is thirsty come to me. Friends, a blessed Pentecost to you, and until we are once again all together in one place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and that joyful, perplexing spirit descend upon you and those you love and dwell with you today always. Amen.